most telling lines. Thank you, busy. One of the most telling lines to me in the song. Of course, they all are powerful, but all my fears and doubts, they can all come too because they can't stay long <laughs> as long as I believe that you are the way, the truth, and the life. Doesn't mean we're not going to ever have any fears and doubts. How many of you know that to be true? Yeah, the old enemy bombs you, and my Lord, uh, a lot of times you feel convicted because you say, why would I even feel anxious about this? Because I, bl- I believe the Lord. Well, you're, it looks like you say, I'm human. How about that? This is why we need a Savior. This is why we have a word that encourages us all the time to be filled with faith and not fear. Well, when you believe that He is the way, the truth, and the life, all your fears and doubts, they can all come too because they can't stay long as long as I believe that you are the way, the truth, and the life. And so don't feel guilty because you might have some occasional you know, doubts or fears. True doubt is fine. The Lord doesn't mind true doubt. You know why? Because true doubt leads to investigation. And when you investigate, you find the truth. I know that's a lost concept now in today's crazy world where people make up stuff that have no bearing to the truth and then just say it like it's real. The Bible says, hey, you want to doubt me? Fine, I can prove myself to be true. Just investigate and you'll find. That's why in Revelation it says, I wish you were hot or I wish you were cold. That sounds weird, doesn't it? You say, the Lord would say, I wish you were hot, 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 hot. He said, well, hey, I don't care if you're cold. If you're cold, you just investigate, and then you can be made hot. But if you're lukewarm, it means you don't care one way or another, and it doesn't matter whether you know the truth or not. It's like, I'm not impressed with anything. And the Lord says, you know what? You make me sick. You know, spew you out of my mouth is what he said. That's, a, that's, a, that's an old King James English way of saying, I'm going to vomit you out. I know that sounds gross, but what do you expect? I don't get to preach today, so be mad at me. All right. Uh, Wesley's coming today, Wesley Peden, our young man. I know everybody that's been here, even any length of time, knows Wesley. Wesley was about this big, (laughs) you know. uh, Lord's used him all through these years. He's now a sophomore in a couple of weeks, starts his sophomore semester at William Carey in Hattiesburg, preparing for the ministry. And the Lord's using him, and he's uh, been involved as an intern at Cross Point Church and has learned a lot about the ministry this summer, right? Yes. Yeah, a lot about the physicality of the ministry and everything else. The buck stops here kind of deal. Yeah, Yeah, right. Well, you did learn some good stuff. I've talked to him through the summer. (laughs) Anyway, I reflect back on a lot of the things. uh, But anyway, we praise the Lord. And Wesley's going to share. I asked him to come. I said, man, hey, are you going to be off by this time? And I think he's got about another week of internship couple, or couple so. More. Starts to school the 16th or so. Uh, I move on, on the 19th. The 19th. the 19th. And so he's almost back in school. Yep. We're going to be praying for you, and we love you. And so Wes is going to share with us what the Lord's put on his heart. I asked him to come do this. He said, hey, I'd love to do it. So you guys listen as the Lord. Listen with your heart. Uh, what a young man who is surrendered to the Lord, senses as God's leadership for what we need to hear as a church and others out there, you guys need to lead. And uh, let's, let's make Wesley welcome today, all right? Wesley, praise the Lord. We, we love you, brother. Thank you. Share it. I'm going to move down here and get, get a little personal today. Um, I'm sorry, brother. I, yeah. I don't, don't need a stage or anything. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I don't think there's anyone... Who doesn't? But I'm Wesley, like uh, Pastor Keith just said. Um, I'm at William Carey. Just finished my first year. Did a summer internship. Almost done with that at Cross Point. Uh, I've loved it there. I'm really grateful to have leaders like Pastor Keith, like Israel at Cross Point, um, and and the people I've been under uh, have really just blessed me. God God has provided for me in ways that I don't deserve, uh, but I'm surely grateful for. Um, I'm here for one reason uh, only, and that's to paint a picture for you of a big, big God, Um, the true God of Christianity, Uh, one that we don't see a lot when we go to uh, various churches or we we plug in online to certain churches. We don't see big gods, uh, but we see big man. 
Um, and, and so I came to, to paint a picture of a big God and a little man um, because there's a gulf between. Um, and so I, I'm asking for your patience, diligence. It's going to be tough. The message today, it's going to be short. I'm going to stay right here. I'm not going to move around. Uh, so it'll be easy for you to follow. Um, I know it's going to, it might not be easy for you to follow because you're used to moving around maybe, but, uh, uh, but I just be, be patient with me, be diligent with me, uh, as I try to expound on the word, um, for you guys to, to receive something for your week and for the rest of your lives, hopefully. So I'm going to pray, uh, and then we'll get started. God, thanks, uh, for Freedom River, for the people of Freedom River, uh, for their open hearts and open minds. Uh, thank you that all the work that we do is matchless compared to the work that you do in us. Thank you for being a big God, a just God, a sovereign God who we can serve and lean on totally. Help us to do that this morning and for the rest of our lives. Help me to expound on this word. Help me to interpret it rightly, to divide it rightly. I love you. I don't want to do your word wrongly. Uh, and thank you for being with me in it. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Amen. Um, so if you've got a Bible, um, you should. If you don't, then you have a phone, I'm sure, and so you can download an app. Uh, and, and we can talk about your convictions there later about having a phone but not a Bible. But... Uh, if you do have your app open, then you can turn to the HCSB version. That's what I'll be reading out of. Um, and I'm going to be in Second Samuel 11 and 12. And I'm just going to be reading scattered throughout there. So just kind of hang with me as I do that. Okay. This is the story of David and Bathsheba. Okay. I know we got kids in the room. I'm aware. I'm just letting you all know I'm aware kids, you don't know what I'm talking about, it's okay. Uh, I'll let your parents tell you when you get in the car. One evening, David got up from his bed and strolled around on the roof of the palace, of his palace. From the roof, he saw a woman bathing, a very beautiful woman. So David sent someone to inquire about her, and he reported, this is Bathsheba, daughter of Eliam and wife of Uriah the Hittite. David sent messengers to get her. When she came, to him, he slept with her. Now she had just been purifying herself, bathing outside, uh, purifying herself from her uncleanness. Afterwards, she returned home. The woman conceived and sent word to inform David, I am pregnant. I'm sure his heart just dropped. David sent orders to Joab, send me Uriah the Hittite. So Joab sent Uriah to David, when Uriah came to him, David asked how Joab and the troops were doing, how the war was going. Then he said to Uriah, go down to your house and wash your feet. So Uriah left the palace, and a, and a gift from the king followed him. But Uriah slept at the door of the palace with all his master's servants. He did not go down to his house. When it was reported to David, Uriah didn't go home, David questioned Uriah. Haven't you just come from a journey? Why didn't you go home? Uriah answered David, The ark, Israel, and Judah are dwelling in tents, and my master Joab and his soldiers are camping in the open field. How can I enter my house to eat and drink and sleep with my wife? As surely as you live by your life, I will not do this. Stay here today also, David said to Uriah, and tomorrow I'll send you back. So Uriah stayed in Jerusalem that day and the next, and David invited Uriah to eat and drink with him, and David got him drunk. This is strike two for David. <laughs> he went out in the evening to lie down on his cot in his master's servants, but he did not go home. The next morning, David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it with Uriah. In the letter, he wrote, put Uriah at the front of the fiercest fighting, then withdraw from him so that he is struck down and dies. And this happens. This isn't just something that was planned and it didn't, it fell through, it didn't happen. It happens. Uriah, go, they go out into battle and the rest of the army draws back. Uriah is left there and the, the other army, the opposing army, kills him. 
That's strike three. Follow me to verse 26, chapter 11. When Uriah's wife had heard that her husband Uriah had died, she mourned for him. When the time of mourning ended, David had brought her to his house. She became his wife and bore him a son. However, the Lord considered what David, what David had done to be evil. On to chapter 12. So the Lord sent Nathan to David. When he arrived, he said to him, there were two men. This is a story, okay? There were two men in a certain city, one rich and the other poor. Do I have a clicker up here? I'm gonna need that. I just thought about that. Right over here? All right. Sorry, guys. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I moved. I lied. Oops. Strike one for me. Um, so back to the story. Nathan came to David, and he tells him this story. He said, there were two men in a certain city, one rich and the other poor. The rich man had a large number of sheep and cattle. But the poor man had nothing except one small lamb that he had bought. He raised it, and it grew up living with him and his children. It shared his meager food and drank from his cup. It slept in his arms, and it was like a daughter to him. People in here who don't like animals might not understand this. It was like a daughter to him. Now, a traveler came to the rich man, but the rich man could not bring himself to take one of his own many sheep or cattle to prepare for the traveler who had come to him. Instead, he took the poor man's one lamb and prepared it for his guest. David was infuriated with the man and said to Nathan, as the Lord lives, the man who did this deserves to die. Because he had done this thing and shown no pity, he must pay four lambs for that lamb. And Nathan replied to David, you are the man. You are the man. David immediately recognizes sin. He realized that he was in the wrong. Uh, up to this point, he had no clue. I know that's hard for us to believe. He had no clue. We have no evidence that he knew what he was doing was wrong. He had to have known a little bit to know that he had to make up for it by outing Uriah. But he realized that he was evil in God's eyes at this point. Um... So the, the title of today's message is, as intense as it might be, it's an, in, it's an intense message. And so the title follows in suit. And it's exactly what David said about himself. Um, and it's the man who did this deserves to die. Uh, he responded to God, not to Nathan, but he responded to his sin to God in, in a psalm. David wrote the majority of the Psalms, not all of them, but the majority. Um, and so if you'll turn with me to Psalm 51, I know we're reading a lot of scripture. I hope you don't have a problem with that. If you do, you can see me afterwards. We'll talk about it. Um, and I'll pray for you. Um, Psalm 51. Now you don't have a problem with scripture, do you? <laughs> uh, Psalm 51, this is David's response uh, to Nathan the prophet who came to him after he'd gone uh, and laid with Bathsheba and was aware of his sin. Uh, read this with me. Be gracious to me, God, according to your faithful love, according to your abundant compassion, blot out my rebellion. Wash away my guilt and cleanse me from my sin, for I am conscious of my rebellion, and my sin is always before me. Against you and you alone I have sinned and done this evil in your sight. So you are right when you pass sentence. You are blameless when you judge. Indeed, I was guilty when I was born, I was sinful when my mother conceived me. Surely you desire integrity in the inner self and you teach me wisdom deep within. Purify me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you've crushed rejoice. Turn your face away from my sins and blot out all my guilt. God, create a clean heart for me and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not banish me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore the joy of your salvation to me and give me a willing spirit. Then I will teach the rebellious your ways and sinners will turn to you. Continues. 
verse 14. Save me from the guilt of bloodshed, God, the God of my salvation. My tongue will sing of your righteousness. Lord, open my lips and my mouth will declare your praise. You do not want a sacrifice or I'd give it. You're not pleased with a burnt offering. The sacrifice pleasing to God is a broken spirit. You will not despise a broken and humbled heart. In your good pleasure, cause Zion to prosper. Build the walls of Jerusalem. Then you will delight in righteous sacrifices, whole burnt offerings. Then bulls will be offered on your altar. This is his response. That's how he responded to his sin. I read that response and I'm convicted. What, what, do I, what do I say to God whenever I sin? That's not what I'm here to tell you about. I'm here to paint a picture of a big God and a, and a little man, right? And there are three components to Christianity that we see that paint this picture for us. There's three components of Christianity. The first one is a sinless God. Hear me very, very carefully. A sinless God a God without sin. David recognized that God was, is, and always will be without sin. Always has been without sin. David says in his psalm that God is faithfully loving, abundantly compassionate, forgiving, completely just, blameless, convicting, creative, redeeming, and righteous. God is the creator of all things concrete and abstract. You are breathing because God allows you to. He is perfect and holy in every way. God has no obligation or need. And listen to me here, this is important. He does not do what he does because it is right for him to do it. What God does is right because he did it. Holy. We are obligated to our morality. We are obligated to the truth, and we have to follow it. We feel obligation to follow it. We should. However, whatever God does is right, because he's God, and we're not. David says that he's accepting of God's wrath and judgment because God is fair. However, he pleads with God for mercy and forgiveness because God is gracious and loving. We see, we see this in verse 4 of this psalm. Uh, it says, so you are right when you pass sentence. You are blameless when you judge. He's talking about himself. He's saying, God, you are right when you pass sentence on me. When you judge me, you are right. I deserve to be judged. I deserve to be sentenced. Uh, think about this legally. You are just when you pass sentence. There's a commonly used story of a well-respected and fair judge um, this, this judge is known throughout his, his city. He's, he's known for being fair, giving people exactly what they deserve for whatever wrong they've done. And his son, the, the man he's brought up, raised, his son goes off and commits a murder, kills a man, cold blood, gets arrested, gets caught, goes before, however unrealistic this might be, goes before the judge who is his father. And surely, with tears in his eyes, the father gives him exactly what he deserves. Because he's just. It doesn't matter that he's your son and might put tears in your eyes. But he murdered. And what does he deserve? Jail time or more. How can God judge and damn the people he created? Justly. Because he's God. And he's perfect. And I would propose that a God who is not just is not worth serving at all. If we, if we follow a God who doesn't give people what they deserve, why are, what's, what's the point in following him? What's so great about him? He's just like us. If, if God is not just, sinners who never repent will go to heaven. Is that biblical? No. Is that even fair? No. Does it happen? No. The second component of Christianity uh, is sinful man. The first was sinless God, and the second is sinful man, a man who is sinful, not a man who is a little, has a little bit of sin in him, 
full of sin, sinful man. I'm intentionally using that word, okay? In the midst of David's worship and recognition of a holy and matchless God, he is fully and apparently aware of his own radical corruption. Radical meaning from the root to the core. We see David refer to himself as rebellious, guilty, constantly sinful, and hostile against God and evil towards God. You might be asking, isn't this, isn't this harsh, harsh, David? Is David a man? He is. So these words certainly apply to him. Sin corrupts humanity to his innermost being from the fall. We see in that, that verse right after the verse we just went back to, Psalm 51, this is verse 5. It says, Indeed, I was guilty when I was born. I was sinful when my mother conceived me. This isn't, he's, he's not just talking about Bathsheba now. I'm not just talking about Uriah. He's saying, when my mom conceived me. It goes to show that David was a person at conception. That's a different tangent. Um, but he was sinful when his mother conceived him. Born sinful, exactly. Corrupted to his core, to the root. We see in Romans uh, 3, verse 23, it says, For all have sinned. Everybody say all. all. What does that mean? Everybody. Everybody. Everybody who's existed from beginning to end, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We see in Ephesians validation in this in, in chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. It says, And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you previously walked according to the ways of this world, according to the ruler who exercises authority over the lower heavens, the spirit now working in the disobedient. We too all previously lived among them in our fleshly desires, carrying out the inclinations of our flesh and thoughts. And we were by nature children under wrath as the others were also dead in trespasses and sin. David was not just sin sick. He was not just sin sick. He didn't just, like we said earlier, he didn't, he didn't just have an ailment of sin. He was sin dead. He was dead in his sin against God. The truth is that these passages and qualities do, mentioned don't only apply to David. And I think that's evident. Unfortunately, they apply to each of us as well. Without the grace and work of God in our hearts, we are dead in sins, dead in our sin. Men in the room, raise your hand, just so I know we got some. No, I'm kidding. Imagine that you found your wife or your girlfriend or a loved one, family member, someone being raped and beaten by a man who had the political power to get away with it, to get away with what he was doing despite what it was. Imagine that. Makes you angry, doesn't it? Makes you want to reach for some weapon or something. You might say something like the title of this message, the man who did this deserves to die. I agree. No words or apologies or beating would be sufficient consequence aside from those that end in death for this person. They are wicked. You were this man. You were this man. I'm this man. Women in the room, this doesn't exclude you. You were this man. Your sin against God is not just being passive against him. It's enmity toward him, being an enemy of him, and being in bondage to sin and hell. I know this is tough. I know this is one of those big horse pills that gets prescribed to you that's hard to swallow. I know this is hard. I, I cannot neglect what Scripture tells us about us for the sake of our comfort. I can't. You are this man. And the man who did this deserves to die. But there's good news. 
I know I've been beating y'all up this whole time. There's good news. And it's the third component of Christianity. And that's a repentant heart. David pleaded for God's mercy on his life. David in his heart realized his sinful nature and his public sin with Bathsheba and Uriah and surely his heart cried out, is there no hope for a wretch like me? Without repentance, no, there is none. There is no hope for a wretch like us. What is repentance? We've talked about it here before. It's turning to God and away from sin. And, and let me assure you, those are completely opposed. And so if you're facing sin, repentance is turning to God, right? It's living a life. Now, now get this, it's not just one time that you're on your knee and say, I repent, I turn to you, God. That's not the end of it. This is living a life that screams and bears fruit, showing that you, hear me, hate sin and love God. Sin is becoming obvious and convicting to you now. Sinning is becoming harder and harder and harder and harder for you. Does it still happen? Yes. All the time. Daily. Moment by moment. I promise. Uh, take it from somebody who has experience in that area. It happens, but do you utterly hate it when it does? You should, you better. You better hate it when it happens. You have a repentant heart. A repentant heart is ongoing, it's continuous. It's, it's continually living in a repentant mindset. Not in a mindset that goes around saying, I suck, I'm terrible, I'm the worst. It's not that. It's saying, God, you're holy. I love you. I hate sin. I hate what I'm doing. I, you have called me redeemed and saved and blessed. Let me show you that I am. I hate sin. I love you. Let me live for you. That's what it is. We see validation of this in 2 Corinthians uh, 7, uh, 10. This is verse 10. And it says, for godly grief produces a repentance not to be regretted, uh, but that leads to salvation. This is not grief in who you are, okay? This is grief in what you've done against God. We see more of this in Psalm 51. I'm just going to reread Psalm 51, 1 through 17. Bear with me. This is what true repentance looks like. David understood it, okay? Be gracious to me, God, according to your faithful love, according to your abundant compassion. Blot out my rebellion. Wash away my guilt and cleanse me from my sin, for I am conscious of my rebellion, and my sin is always before me. Against you and you alone I have sinned and done this evil in your sight. So you are right when you pass sentence. You are blameless when you judge. Indeed, I was guilty when I was born. I was sinful when my mother conceived me. Surely you desire integrity in the inner self and you teach me wisdom deep within. Purify me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Turn your face away from my sins and blot out all my guilt. God, create a clean heart for me and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not banish me from your presence. Or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore the joy of your salvation to me and give me a willing spirit. Then I will teach the rebellious your ways and sinners will turn to you. Save me from the guilt of bloodshed, God, the God of my salvation. And my tongue will sing of your righteousness. Lord, open my lips and my mouth will declare your praise. You do not want to sacrifice or I'd give it. You are not pleased with the burnt offering. Sacrifice pleasing to you is a broken spirit, and you will not despise a broken and humbled heart. A broken and humbled heart. This is what repentance is. It's going broken and humbled 
by your sin before God, who is awesome, big, matchless. If I haven't painted the picture for you yet, let me clarify. God is here and far beyond, and we are here on the ground. When we listen to messages that tickle our ear about who we are, we're raising this and lowering this, and, and we're trying to pull God down and bring us up. The truth is, he is far beyond. And I'm so glad. That's what we need. If it was up to a small God, we would get nowhere. And I propose to you that, and this, this might seem harsh, bear with me. I propose to you that the God who those, the claimed Christians who, the God that they worship, that is a low and little God, is a candle light in the midst of the sun of the true God of Christianity. God is huge. He's amazing. He's the God who has planned everything, who is sovereign. But he's the God who's tender enough to bend down to hear your prayer. He's a personal God who chose you. Legally speaking, in heaven, your record is cleared by faith. And in the perfectly just and loving God and repentant, hate for your own sin. Your record is cleared by faith in the perfectly loving and just God. And it's cleared by repentant hate for your own sin. What I want you to get from this is the forgiveness of God begins with a repentant heart. Christianity begins with a heart that hates sin and loves God above all. For your sake, hate sin, love God. And I tell you, if you love God, you'll hate sin. Hating sin is a byproduct. You don't have to try to hate sin. You just got to pursue loving God. You'll hate sin. You'll do him wrong and you'll know it because you love him. And you might be asking after me painting the picture of a sinful man, a radically corrupted man to his core, to his innermost being, telling you that you are this man. You might be asking, how can God justify someone like me? Is there hope for a wretch like me? Someone so unclean and hurt and sinning constantly. The Apostle Paul tells us how in uh, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 1 through 4. This is the gospel, you guys. Now, brothers, I want to clear. This is, this is 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. Now, brothers, I want to clarify for you the gospel I proclaim to you. You received it and have taken your stand on it. You were also saved by it. If you hold on to the message I proclaim to you, unless you believe for no purpose. For I passed on to you as most important what I also received. That Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures. The prophecy of the Old Testament is true. Jesus came. He died to save people like you and me, if we believe, if we repent. He raised to make it possible for us to raise up with him. While we were sinners, God reached down and poured the wrath that we deserved on his own son. And he treated Jesus the way we should have been treated. And he treated us the way Jesus should have been treated. Repent. Because the kingdom of heaven has come near. Invest time and keep God's word to know him and love him more. He is worthy of all that you have and all that you do. This is a big God that we serve. I pray that after this service, you can understand what true repentance is. And if you don't know what that is, talk to me, talk to Pastor Keith, talk to somebody. Read your Bible, most of all. 
as great as Pastor Keith is, as, as okay as I am, the Bible's so much better. It's his word. And it'll tell you more about what you, what you need to know regarding repentance and salvation uh, than me or Pastor Keith ever could. So I told you it'd be short. I meant it. Y'all can go to get some chicken real quick now. Be first in line. That's how we like it, huh? Um, yeah, we'll beat the Presbyterians today. Yeah. I, I want I want y'all to not to harden your hearts in this moment, but to be tender hearted now. Um, to just open up and and search yourself, examine your heart, and and talk to God and and say God and. If there's sin in my heart, reveal it to me. If you're, if you're calling me to salvation, do it. Lead me there now in this moment. Pray with me. God, we are so grateful for how big you are. So grateful for your love that's matchless, for your power that's matchless, your sovereignty and your tenderness, your mercy and your love your justice, your truth, your word. Thank you that we can come together in fellowship on one day a week to talk about you, to talk to you, uh, to worship you, and to show you that we love you. God, help us to hate sin in the midst of our love for you. God, if you're leading your church to repentance, if you're leading the people of Freedom River to repentance, I pray that you would work in their heart. Show them their sins. Surely they have some. Show them to them. Turn them towards yourself. God, we love you. Thank you so much for your son and providing a way uh, to you, for providing truth and providing life uh, for your children. It's in his precious name that we pray. Amen. 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 What a good word. Amen, guys. Yeah. There you go. Hallelujah. Uh, I, I know, Melissa, you guys, and Bobby, you guys are proud of Wesley and, and everything the Lord's doing in him. And I am too, because uh, what he speaks is great theology, straight from the word, uh, true, right, exactly. It's not uh, some fashion show kind of presentation of what the reality of truth is, which is a good thing. It shows your heart. A sinless God, truly perfect. Uh, we're not. That's why we need a Savior. And we're saved when the, we get convicted. And that's conviction. And then it leads us to live a different life, which is repentance. I mean, repentance is just not something you believe. It's the way you live. You guys say it to your children all the time. Don't keep telling me that you're sorry for being whatever you are. Start living differently, and then you don't have to tell me I'll believe. And, you know, and then you know, you'll be living a life that shows that you truly have learned something, and you're trying to be different. You know? That's why we need a Savior, guys, because it's impossible to do without, without help. Uh, and, and God might have brought you, like, like Wesley said, might have brought you to this point in your own life, and you're sitting here going, you know, I'm sick of being the way I am. This is ridiculous, you know. My life keeps spiraling downhill all the time. Well, God offers you a chance to begin the process. I mean, the, the first thing it takes to live differently is to be convinced you need to. And I'm telling you, it takes something dramatic to cause you to believe that. Now, I, I'm glad, I hope it can be a word at church. You know, that's the easy way. I mean, but God does have other ways, right? You know, and you can come to an end of yourself in lots of ways. God wants it to be the easy way. Hear a word, let the Holy Spirit convict you, then you change, and everything's hunky-dory. Or make God uh, bump out some stuff and all that, and then you finally go, how dumb am I, you know? So uh, choose the easy way or the hard way. I mean, it's your way. All right. Stand to your feet, will you? Maybe the Lord's spoken to you. Bow your head with me. Maybe the Lord's spoken to you today. What a good word, Wesley. Great, great. I would call him Pastor Wesley, 
but I'm not sure exactly what God's called him. I think he's uh, right now thinking maybe he'll be a church planter, which is a great call from God. It's a missionary is really what it is to go and plant churches in places where there's a need for a church led by the Spirit of God. And uh, that's a good calling, a great calling, a wonderful calling. And if that's what God's calling Wesley to, we pray for that and we pray for whatever uh, the Lord's leadership. I did about six things before I actually was con convinced that I'm supposed to be a pastor. That was 43 years ago, so the first eight or nine years of the ministry, I was a missionary, a youth pastor, a mu music pastor, believe it or not. Long story about that. Uh, I did a uh, student ministry pastor because nobody cared what I thought. I was 18 years old, so, you know, the, the students were the only one that would listen to me, you know. Uh, but, but anyway, the point being that uh, God has a call. God has a call, and it is a call. And, uh, and Wesley has received that from the Lord, and he's preparing himself, doing everything he can as a young man to learn what is right and, and how to present it and how to be a, a good m messenger of the gospel. So we pray for him uh, at William Carey, and we're proud of him. I don't know about you guys. I'm proud of him and proud of what the Lord has done in his life. And he's proven himself to be loyal and faithful. If you don't believe it, just go back. You can get on YouTube and type in Freedom River Church, and you can go back and watch every praise video, which is probably hundreds and hundreds of songs that are from when we started, what, uh, broadcasting two years ago, two and a half. I'm terrible on time. but And, I, and you're hard-pressed, seriously. There are about only two Sundays until he began uh, being away at college that you can find that anybody else is playing the drums but him, which means hundreds of services. Nobody else was back there but him, which means he was here every Sunday and every song. And uh, the only time, I think, is when he went on a mission trip. You know, he was gone. Great, you know, dedication to the Lord. Great discipline in life. That's what it takes. That's what it takes to move forward, you know, not to be saved. You don't earn that, but as a reflection, that's what it takes. And I thank God for him. I, I know I'm praising Wesley, and he doesn't really like that. But I just want you to know, as an example, this is the truth. You know, you, you say, how can I become a, a person the Lord can use? Well, discipline, just like everything else in life. You want to be successful? You have to discipline yourself. You want to be smart? Discipline yourself. You want to be wealthy? Discipline yourself. You want to be strong physically? Discipline yourself. You're not going to get strong laying on the couch eating a pack of pig skins watching ESPN. If you do what this old crazy body wants, you're going to be lazy, fat, sorry, broke, and worthless. So you can, you can do what feels natural and be lazy, fat, worthless, and broke. But if you want to be smart, prosperous, wealthy, and moving forward in life, say the word discipline. Yes. There you go, man. You can be dumb. Just don't read anything and don't study anything and just listen to the sports or news. There, you'd be just dumb as a rock. But if you want to be smart, you got to, I'm, I'm preaching. All right. I, hey, <laughs> hey, look, I don't want, I mean, we've already beaten the Presbyterians to the chicken house. I, I, the Episcopals are the ones now we're worried about. They'll... They're even earlier. So bow your head with me. Maybe the Lord has spoken to your heart today. If you feel that you need to make a response to what you've heard, and, and, and it is a response, if you want to, you know, at the end of the service, say to somebody like me or, or any of us, Pastor, I, I made this response. I think it's important for you to know. I, I feel like I need to tell somebody and uh, pray for me. Uh, but when, before you leave out the door, come down here and say, Pastor, you know, I, I did this. Or, or, speak to, or speak to Wesley. He was, he's our pastor today. He's our minister today. Speak to him and say, but the words you said had an impact on my heart. Uh, praise the Lord. If you want to trust Christ the same way, I open my heart. I let Jesus come in. I just want to let someone know or pray for me, any need you might have. Uh, before you leave, I'm going to say amen in just a second, and then everybody's going to start to leave. But before you leave, if you'll come here, that'll be wonderful. One other little tiny, tiny announcement before we walk out the door. 
there's going in our community we have a wonderful lady carol most of you know her uh, she has, uh, because of connections with some church ministry in Georgia uh, or some friend in the ministry, they have lots of meats and, and all that kind of stuff that are delivered to Gulfport at her church and school supplies. Uh, it's going to be Monday and Tuesday of this week. They're going to be distributing them. You've been invited to come and, and just go there. Uh, I don't have the information in my hands at the moment, but we are going to put it on our website or put it on our Facebook church website page and the address and all the information you need. So if you are in need, if you say, man, I, I need something to eat, I need this, this, this stuff or school supplies, uh, some kind of help with that, uh, please pay attention to that. FreedomRiverChurch.org is our website. And I don't know what to do with Facebook because I don't have anything to do with that. But you guys that are Facebookers know how to. It's Freedom River Church something on Facebook. Uh, but we have a website. And uh, you can get that information, all right? So if you need that, uh, pay attention. Father.